Canary Row, Chapter 13, Part 1 of Chapter 13. Mac and the boys slept peacefully on the pine needles. Sometime before dawn, Eddie came back. He had gone a long way before he found a Model T. And then, when he did, he wondered whether or not it would be a good idea to take the needle out of its seat. It might not fit. So he took the whole carburetor. The boys didn't wake up when he got back. He lay down beside them and slept under the pine trees. There was one nice thing about Model T's. The parts were not only interchangeable, they were unidentifiable. There is a beautiful view from the Carmel grade. The curving bay with the waves creaming on the sand. The dune country around seaside and right at the bottom of the hill. The warm intimacy of the town. Mac got up in the dawn and hustled his pants where they bound him, and he stood looking down on the bay. He could see some of the purse saners coming in. A tanker stood over against seaside, taking on oil. Behind him, the rabbits stirred in the bush. Then the sun came up and shook the night chill out of the air the way you'd shake a rug. When he felt the first sun warmth, Mac shivered. The boys ate a little bread while Eddie installed the new carburetor, and when it was ready, they didn't bother to crank it. They pushed it out to the highway and coasted in gear until it started, and then Eddie, driving, they backed up over the rise, over the top, and turned and headed forward and down past Hatton Fields. In Carmel Valley, the artichoke plants stood gray-green, and the willows were lush along the river. They turned left up the valley. Luck blossomed from the first. A dusty Rhode Island red rooster who had wandered too far from his own farmyard crossed the road, and Eddie hit him without running too far off the road. Sitting in the back of the truck, Hazel picked him as they went and let the feathers fly from his hand, the most widely distributed evidence on record, for there was a little breeze in the morning blowing down from Jamesburg, and some of the red chicken feathers were deposited on Point Lobos, and some even blew out to sea. The Carmel is a lovely little river. It isn't very long, but in its course it has everything a river should have. It rises in the mountains and tumbles down a while, runs through shallows, is dammed to make a lake, spills over the dam, crackles among round boulders, wanders lazily under sycamores, spills into pools where trout live, drops in against banks where crayfish live. In the winter it becomes a torrent, a mean little fierce river, and in the summer it is a place for children to wade in and for fishermen to wander in. Frogs blink from its banks, and the deep ferns grow beside it. Deer and foxes come to drink from it, secretly in the morning and evening, and now and then a mountain lion, crouched flat, laps its water. The farms of the rich little valley back up to the river and take its water for the orchards and the vegetables. The quail call beside it, and the wild doves come whistling in at dusk. Raccoons pace its edges looking for frogs. It's everything a river should be. A few miles up the valley, the river cuts in under a high cliff from which vines and ferns hang down. At the base of this cliff, there is a pool, green and deep, and on the other side of the pool, there is a sandy place where it is good to sit and cook your dinner. Mac and the boys came down to this place happily. It was perfect. If frogs were available, they would be here. It was a place to relax, a place to be happy. On the way out, they had thriven. In addition to the big red chicken, there was a sack of carrots which had fallen from a vegetable truck, half a dozen onions which had not. Mac had a bag of coffee in his pocket. In the truck, there was a five-gallon can with the top cut off. The whining jug was nearly half full. Such things as salt and pepper had been brought. Mac and the boys would have thought anyone who traveled without salt, pepper, and coffee very silly indeed. Without effort, confusion, or much thought, four round stones were rolled together on the little beach. The rooster who had challenged the sunrise of this very day lay dismembered and clean in water in the five-gallon can with peeled onions about him, while a little fire of dead willow sticks sputtered between the stones. A very little fire. Only fools build big fires. It would take a long time to cook this rooster, for... It had taken him a long time to achieve his size and muscularity. 
but as the water began to boil gently about him, he smelled good from the beginning. Mac gave them a pep talk. The best time for frogs is at night, he said, so I guess we'll just lay around till it gets dark. They sat in the shade and gradually, one by one, they stretched out and slept. Mac was right. Frogs do not move around much in the daytime. They hide under ferns, and they look secretly out of holes under rocks. The way to catch frogs is with a flashlight at night. The men slept, knowing they might have a very active night. Only Hazel stayed awake to replenish the little fire under the cooking chicken.